Hey there, Khan Academy. Hope you're all having a great time. Uh, we have a really fun program for you this year, and I'm sure you're all enjoying it. Uh, my name is Ian Gallagher, KE7MAP, and I really hope everyone's been enjoying the virtual Khan Academy so far. I know I have. Uh, presenting with me is my friend Morgan, and today we're going to be talking to you about Burning Man, that thing in the desert. Hi, I'm Morgan Davis, KB7ZMC. Ian and I have both attended Burning Man for a number of years, and we both volunteer at two different departments at the event. Ian is, with the, is an emergency communications dispatcher, and I volunteer as a Black Rock Ranger. We'll explain what both of these things are here in a bit. Thanks, Morgan. Before we dive into what you and, I, you and I do as volunteers there, what exactly is Burning Man? A lot of people may have heard of it, but if you haven't been, it can sound like quite a bit of a mystery. Sure, at its core, Burning Man is a week-long event that takes place in the middle of the Black Rock Desert, which is an alkali flat in the northwest part of Nevada. Throughout that week, it becomes a temporary city called Black Rock City, with around 80,000 people and it's a bit of a social experiment. There's absolutely nothing at the site before and after the event, so everything is brought in temporarily. Burning Man itself is only open to the public for about a week, and it starts on the weekend before Labor Day, often in the peak Nevada desert heat. A lot of people don't realize this, but there's a decent number of core infrastructure and safety volunteers that are also at the site and stay there for almost four months uh, between J July and October, handling the preparation for the event and the cleanup afterwards. That's a significant amount of time. If uh, any of you haven't been to Burning Man, but you're familiar with the Nevada deserts, just think about being out there for upwards of four months with only resources that you and your friends brought with you. So I think that's all really impressive. Um, here's a little bit about what the Burning Man organization themselves have to say about their event. Uh, the quote here is, once a year, tens of thousands of people gather in Nevada's Black Rock Desert to create Black Rock City, a temporary metropolis dedicated to community, art, self-expression, and self-reliance. In this crucible of creativity, all are welcome. Now, I think our presentation is going to be focusing on a few aspects of that in particular. Um, Self-reliance is a big one that we're going to be touching on. There, while there are safety services out there, you are expected to take care of yourself. And there's no vendors, there's, there's no water supply. Um, it really is, a, 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 besides the other aspects of the event, it's a, it's a fascinating exercise in, in survival in a difficult environment and um, learning to rely on yourself, that's self-reliance. Yeah, that's a, one of my favorite parts about it is that you know, I've always been a fan of camping and going into the alpine environment where you have to be pretty self-reliant, but this is uh, just that at a different level. The desert is such a harsh environment. Um, you know, we think of it as uh, normally a really hot, arid place, and a lot of the time at Burning Man, that's the case. But you can also have, you know, torrential downpours with no notice, and uh, those are really different environments in environments like that. So... Here's a picture, and this one is actually uh, of Burning Man sometime in the middle of the week. Uh, it's an aerial shot, probably from a drone, um, or uh, you know, there's actually also an airport at Burning Man, and uh, sometimes you'll actually have the opportunity to go up in a small personal airplane. You can kind of see each one of those little specks in there is is probably is you know a vehicle, a tent, an RV, and you can see how how far it goes off into the distance. Yeah, another thing that this picture really makes kind of clear is um, you can see that each little set of vehicles and such are broken up. And uh, just like any other city, we have blocks. And you can see the street structure really here. And we have a few slides that we're going to talk about um, the, the kind of the civil engineering layout uh, in a moment here. But this is a nice perspective that lets you see uh, down into the individual blocks and the structure of the, the city a bit. So um, this is actually, um, you know, just a different aerial view. Uh, this is actually a satellite photo of uh, one of the recent events. Uh, similar time, middle of the week, so pretty established. Uh, a lot of camps are there and set up, um, but just a really neat perspective. And uh, you can also see on the perimeter, there is a Pentagon outline in the sand there. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in the future as well. 
And then if we zoom in on that past picture, uh, there's this little special camp in the middle. And uh, you may have guessed this one holds the name Center Camp. And Center Camp is where participants can find a lot of core services to the event, information, access to um, various departments, and well-known destinations in Black Rock City. Yeah, it's one that, uh, you know, once you've been to Burning Man, you've got settled. It's one of the first big destinations you often will find yourself going to, um, either to meet up with some people or to um, get some of the core services that are available there, um, or just see some of the more uh, kind of structured art that is set up as well. This map gives some more detail about the kind of real world distances at Burning Man. As you've seen now, the camps are laid out in a, in a rather particular fashion. And that shape is based off of radial streets based on the face of a clock and by the hours on that clock face. Uh, and then there are concentric streets progressing outward from the inner part of the ring to the outer streets. And those are lettered uh, alphabetically. Yeah, and you can see also from this particular uh, kind of map and picture that the overall diameter from, you know, end of the outermost street to the other side of the city is just over two miles. And the outer circumference of that street is just right about four and a half miles long. Um, and you can also see uh, there's some stats on the top of this image uh, that kind of have uh, your average time it takes to travel from a few different points there either by foot or by bicycle, which uh, is a really popular mode of transportation at Burning Man. Uh, this also gives you an idea of scale. And with this, you can see the actual perimeter, that Pentagon that Ian mentioned earlier, um, which is known as the trans, tran, trash fence. And um, that is the absolute border of the city. You need a ticket to enter. Um, no one, no one enters without a ticket, and uh, once you're inside, you don't go outside the perimeter unless it's through the official exit, and then you're on your way home. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then again, you know, we have some of the time markers here. So if you remember Center Camp that we focused on a few minutes ago, uh, you can see that there's the green marker, the leftmost one here, and from Center Camp out to the uh, furthest point of the Pentagon there, the estimate for an average person is a 40 minute walk and that's uh, two miles from that point. So again, this is really just to hope, you know, help impart the scale of the event and the event site for everyone to realize that it's, it's quite large. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very fascinating environment. All right. And then just uh, one last thing to kind of help with the scale. Uh, if you're uh, in the Seattle area, Seattle, Washington, this is a one to one scale overlay of the city map on top of downtown Seattle. So, uh, again, for those familiar with the area, you can see that the open part of the city that we were just talking about uh, being two miles from that center camp location would extend all the way up to the Stevens and Madison Valley area on this map. Uh, which, you know, the, the trash fence isn't represented on this particular image. This is just, just the, the core city itself. Right, exactly. Just the, the city streets in the center, basically. So, Morgan, I think that helps a lot. You know, that really explains what the event site is and what kind of the city itself is. But I don't know. Do you think some people watching may think that there's more to it than what we've talked about so far? Well, now that you mention it, there are quite a few things that get a bit more interesting. Yeah, I knew I was forgetting something. So let's get into that. Honestly, it's a bit hard to explain what Burning Man is to people who haven't been there to experience it. But this is something you might just randomly come across walking down the street. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't necessarily an abnormal thing. Uh, and it's that spontaneity and that, uh, you know, fluidity of what can happen, uh, what you'll see in a later slide referred to as immediacy. Um, if you see a little train of uh, teddy bears coming at you on a bunch of red flyers, 
Oh, that's just another day at Burning Man. And uh, you start to get used to it to a degree. But uh, to the outsider, I can see why this might look a little interesting. But it's really a fun part of the event as well. So these are some examples of one of the many art pieces you might find at Burning Man. Yeah, there's so many unique and really impressive pieces. Um, for this one in particular, you can get an idea of the scale of the piece just from the people that are standing right uh, around by it. Um, and just a little bit more detail on this particular piece, uh, it's hard to tell from this picture, but it's actually a steel mesh and it's entirely hand welded out of thousands of pieces of metal individual rods that are used to make that exterior. Um, and this is one of the larger pieces and it actually, uh, different variations of it come back, um, almost every year, the artist, uh, kind of changes it up and, uh, they're known for bringing something similar back. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's just really interesting to see how they change throughout the years. And if you are like me, you start to think about what were the technical difficulties to construct this, you know, you pre-construct some of it, um, outside of the event, and then you have to do some assembly actually at the event as well. So the challenges that that introduces are one of the things that really fascinates me about the event. Ah, and this is a picture of the man. Uh, that is Burning Man's central effigy, um, which, as many of you may know, is destined to be burned at the end of the event. That's kind of the, the main thing about Burning Man, right? So it's located right in the middle of the city. Uh, if you remember from those previous maps, uh, not center camp, but in the middle where all the roads would kind of intersect in the open area, that's where the man is located. You have anything else to say about the man, Morgan? I think we'll see a few more pictures of the man throughout the presentation. Yeah, he's, he's a bit of a centerpiece. <laughs> Burning Man is a lot of things, and it's different to everyone who attends. Sometimes... Sometimes people refer to it as a festival, but it really isn't like a festival like the ones you might be familiar with, like the Electric Daisy Carnival or the Coachella or Paradiso and such. Uh, while music and parties are definitely a part of Burning Man, uh, those aren't for everyone. And there are there's a plethora and multitude of other activities that are not um, big parties that people bring and come to come to participate in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, as we mentioned just in that previous slide uh, or two, you know, art is a really critical part about Burning Man. It's really core to the, um, the ethos of the event and the organizers and a lot of the participants. Uh, really permeates all aspects of the city and the event. Um, this is somewhere that you're gonna see everything from handmade paintings to that 80 foot tall, you know, fabricated steel art piece. Um, and then you'll also see elaborate pieces that actually move and further elaborate pieces that actually move based on participant interaction. Um, that's a really core part about Burning Man is it's an interactive event. It's not an, it's not an event where you attend and you view. It is really meant for everyone to participate. Another important aspect of Burning Man um, and the art of Burning Man is the vehicles known as mutant vehicles. And in addition to you know, moving people around, they're large scale mobile art. Yeah, mutant vehicles are definitely a fun aspect. And we've got a few pictures here. So here's a couple of some of the prominent or more prominent uh, mutant vehicles uh, seen during the day. Um, the, I'm sure you can guess which one is which here, but we have a mm -hmm. uh, disco fish uh, and then the other one is El Popo Mechanico. And uh, it's a kind of a robotic flame-throwing octopus vehicle. <laughs> yeah, and that is uh, definitely a crowd favorite. Uh, I always love to see these ones, uh, El Popo in particular. Um, once you get to get up close to it, it's just so intricate and amazing how they make these things. Um, and Morgan, like you, you know, you mentioned that these are, you know, mobile art pieces, but they serve some purpose too, don't they? They do transport people around the city. They provide 
um, you know, various activities and interactivity. Yeah, one of the one of the neat things about them is, uh, in general, um, everyone is supposed to be allowed to go ahead and get on one of these mutant vehicles. So if they're out driving around and you come across it and you want to hop on and go wherever they're going, the the general uh, the general mo is that they'll stop, let you on, and you can just kind of have fun and check out new things and experience other people's creations that way. All right, so in addition to mutant vehicles, uh, here's an example of one of the larger sound camps uh, with a party going on at night. So this is a little bit more similar to what some people think about Burning Man, um, but it's just a small part of it. You know, there's a, a relatively small number of these large camps that throw large, elaborate, really well-run parties uh, at night, but um, it's by far not the entirety of the event. And here is actually a picture of, uh, you know, what looks like just a, a large fire, but it turns out this is actually a picture of the man burning at the end of the week. So with most of the city out around it to watch, um, they're just really focused on this closing event. And uh, it's kind of one last big party for the, the week as it draws to an end. Uh, these are a few more kind of uh, close-up shots of some of the activities you might see at Burning Man. So we have a couple here of fire performers. Uh, and then the other one here is another photo of the, the man, the man burn uh, at the end of the week. Uh, and you see the flames here are uh, intentional and controlled uh, fuel explosions, which is part of the pyrotechnics of the man burn and igniting the structure. Yeah, there's a lot of different types of uh, burning events that happen at Burning Man. And for the bigger ones like the man and uh, another one called the temple that we'll talk about later, uh, they really get elaborate with the pyrotechnics to make sure that there's a really good show um, and also to make sure that there's actually reliable combustion. Um, and that partly actually becomes a safety concern as well, because you want to make sure that you don't have a partially burned structure um, because that could eventually be dangerous to participants in the, in the uh, aftermath of that as well. So it's all very controlled, as Morgan said. Um, there's very professional teams that handle all the pyrotechnics and stuff of this nature, and we're going to talk about that a bit. So we've seen a little sample of things at Burning Man now, but I also want to mention what are called the 10 principles. Uh, the event organizers and the participant community really seriously take these to heart. Uh, and that's both during the event as well as after the event, just during their normal lives throughout the year. So they're up on the screen here, but I'm also just going to read them to you because they're that important to Burning Man. So the principles are in order, in no particular order, I should say, radical inclusion, gifting, decommodification, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, leaving no trace, participation, and finally, immediacy. If you want to learn more about each of what uh, these principles represent and what they mean, um, check out the, the Burning Man website for more information. Perfect. Yeah. And if, uh, if anyone does want to check that out right now, it's burningman.org. All righty. So now we want to talk to you a little bit about what it is that myself and Morgan actually do as volunteers at Burning Man and why emergency services are needed in case you haven't figured out some reasons that that may be. As it turns out, some of those art pieces that show up uh, and structures that people build are not always the safest and can be outright dangerous at times. As a participant, you're expected to be responsible uh, and take safety into your own hands. And you'll often hear a common phrase, which is, uh, read the back of your ticket, uh, which contains the uh, uh, liability disclaimer on the back. That's right. That is one that you hear a lot of in the, uh, in the volunteer community in particular. Uh, so for example, while really amazing and beautiful, this, uh, this steel warthog, it also proved to be quite dangerous as initially designed and built. 
So it was designed to spin around on its axis, and as it turns out, that actually resulted in a good number of pinching and shearing injuries, uh, mostly of people's fingers, unfortunately. So eventually it was actually welded in place uh, because that safety hazard was you know, brought to light a little bit more than maybe it was initially. And one of my favorite things uh, at Burning Man is fire, because who doesn't like a little fire? Um, this is a picture right here of four 100-pound propane tanks, which fills the flame effects for this mutant vehicle, which happens to be the El Popo Mechanico that we saw a few slides back. Uh, accidents or injury involving fire are actually quite rare at Burning Man. And this is in part due to strict safety regulations required to have uh, any fire art. And every piece of fire art uh, is inspected for safety as well as compliance with National Fire Protection Association codes. Uh, this is performed by a group known as FAST, which is the Fire Art Safety Team. And every piece gets a certification sticker in order to operate. Yeah, that's really great information. And uh, we don't have slides on it here, but um, those same safety procedures are also followed by, um, you know, all the smaller regional events that uh, that run around the country that are related to Burning Man. Uh, and they all have uh, similar requirements as well. And Morgan actually has done quite a bit of fire art himself. And so he's uh, become quite familiar with those regulations and uh, abiding by them. So he can speak to them being uh, no joke, for sure. So that's one thing that safety is top of mind for. On the right, we also see uh, the 2018 art piece called Night at the Climb In, which is essentially seven vehicles on a skewer. And uh, at the top there, you'll see that there's both a uh, RV and a crow's nest. And in that RV is actually a public bar. So yeah, to get to that crow's nest, which is the final destination with the view, you have to go through a bar. So some people might have a drink or two when they're in that bar. So as you can think, uh, this may lead to some problems. Uh, eventually this piece was also closed due to several fall injuries. So there's really no end to what you're gonna find at Burning Man, including wholesome things like an ultra marathon that starts at sunrise and covers a distance of 50 kilometers in the harsh desert environment. So here's uh, actually the outline. It's another one of those maps, and you can see the route that this takes, and uh, it actually takes several laps. So uh, I believe four laps total, uh, 11 and a half kilometers um, to bring it up to that 50K status. Well, but sometimes, even during events like that, people may make, how do we say, interesting choices. Uh, this person is definitely having fun. Probably nothing came of it. But you can imagine that some things could end up needing uh, a little bit more uh, care than others. Bicycles are a huge part of Burning Man and Burning Man culture. There are far more bikes than vehicles, and almost everyone brings a, a bicycle to get around the city on. As you can have seen from some of the previous maps, the scale of things and how long it takes to walk somewhere, bikes are quite efficient. Uh, this happens to be uh, a popular bike course set up by one of the camps there. Unfortunately, it does result or often results in a lot of calls, uh, uh, including things like serious back injuries. Yeah, here's another view of that same uh, bike course. And you can imagine that, you know, someone who's a little too excited could get into some trouble here. And unfortunately, on the emergency services side, it is one that we recognize as a uh, a source of calls around medical issues. And as Morgan mentioned, particularly um, back injuries do occur from this area. Mutant vehicles, while fun and impressive, uh, present their own safety concerns, um, such as size and visibility challenges. Uh, the elaborate designs are impressive, but do introduce additional risk. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to demonstrate in a photo um, the size of some of the mutant vehicles that you'll see at Burning Man. Uh, I felt like this one does, uh, does it some pretty decent justice, but uh, I mean, there's a, a popular one there many years that is literally a full-size yacht that has been converted to operate on a semi-truck platform. 
So if you can think of the, you know, what what it means to be a, a full semi truck uh, or a, you know, a full yacht, and that's just driving around in the uh, open desert, you know, that'll help give you an idea of the sizes that we're talking about here. So while fire, at least undesired fire, is actually fairly rare at Burning Man, accidental fires do still happen. And as you can imagine, they can get out of control very fast. Um, RV fires are one particular example. They can be really especially dangerous, um, mainly because RVs are often surrounded by tents or other RVs or other vehicles um, because they end up just needing to be parked fairly densely due to the population of the city. Um, Another risk is carbon monoxide poisoning. That is a concern due to the heavy use of propane for fire effects as well as for other just normal heating and such, as well as generators that are used at the event. Well, not to worry. I think that's right. Just call an adult. So there are nearly 30 top level volunteer teams at Burning Man. Um, some of those include uh, the gate and perimeter teams, uh, the Department of Mutant Vehicles that we talked about, airport management, as there's actually a fully functional licensed airport at the event, uh, and numerous others that we won't be able to list here. The remainder of this presentation is going to focus on our teams, which work really closely with each other. Those are the Black Rock, Black Rock Rangers and my team, the Emergency Services Department. Black Rock Rangers are one of the uh, first and frontline support uh, resources for participants, no matter what their needs may be. Simple questions get honest answers. Uh, and we help participants work out problems that arise uh, uh, in the form of conflict mediation, de-escalation. Uh, our focus is to help make sure that everyone has a good time at Burning Man, and we want to keep things from getting messy. Usually people just need some guidance to get going in the right direction, and rangers are there to help with that. Additionally, rangers are, pre are prevalent around the city and often first on scene to many issues, and we can bring in additional resources such as medical, fire, even law enforcement if that's needed. Uh, the rangers also are primarily responsible for large-scale safety perimeters, uh, uh, in particular ones that protect the man, temple, and other large-scale burns. Yeah, and the Emergency Services Department is the team that encompasses medical, which includes volunteer basic, as well as professional advanced life support teams, firefighting, crisis intervention, and all communications at Burning Man. Communications, in this case, includes the technology teams that manage the communications infrastructure, such as radios and antennas and that sort of thing, as well as the ESD dispatch department, which is where I am. Just from looking at these two departments so far, you can see that the organization at Burning Man could get very complicated very quickly and with the scale of the event. Uh, thankfully, many of the event staff and volunteers um, are professionals in some, some manner outside the event. Uh, everything is organized and built upon the Proven Incident Command System, or ICS, uh, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely nice and refreshing to have that be the case. So this slide just shows um, a really, a fairly actually top level um, overview of the, uh, the ICS structure from the top. So the event operations manager is uh, essentially the IC for the overall event. And then you're going to have several departments underneath there. And I just represented uh, both Morgan and mine on this slide. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the Rangers, they have their department manager. And then they have uh, a few levels below that, and uh, the shift command is one of those one of those levels. And then from there on, there's individual teams, and that's where someone like Morgan would be. And then for myself, uh, emergency services department is uh, led by the chief of emergency services, and there's uh, duty chiefs for medical, fire, and communications. And in my case, uh, as a dispatcher, I reside under that communications chief. And all the other teams follow ICS just as well. So the ESD communications team is responsible for all the radios at Burning Man. And the radios are how all the staff talk to each other. Cell phones aren't an option in that environment. Um, that's because the, the site is too far away from any established cellular towers. And while a few temporary towers do get uh, put in place during the event, 
they quickly get overloaded once the event is at capacity. So realistically, cell phones just aren't an option, certainly not for reliable communications um, by the event staff. So this slide shows some quick information about the radio system used at the event. Uh, it's a modern DMR tier three trunk system. There's over 120 talk groups that are in use and that supports over 2000 event radios. Those are used by, again, every team in every department. And the entire event area is covered by several redundant repeater systems. With a population of 80,000, it's not too surprising to learn that a number of amateur radio operators uh, attend uh, the event at Burning Man. And what do hams do when they go places? They bring radios. Um, it's common to find established chat frequencies, uh, various uh, amateur repeaters that have been uh, temporarily established at Burning Man uh, with participants legitimately practicing the hobby. Uh, there's also the local Black Rock uh, Amateur Radio Association, which is very supportive of the hams at, at the event at Burning Man. Yeah, I remember the first few times that I went to Burning Man, uh, actually, uh, Morgan introduced me to the event, and I had my radio going with uh, APRS tracking, and we actually were able to meet up with each other as I was entering the event. We got on the radio and made contact before I actually found him in the, uh, in the event site, so that was pretty cool. Um, I have fond memories of practicing amateur radio over at Burning Man. Um, sometimes, in addition to that, though, people do transmit where they shouldn't. Sometimes intentionally or maliciously, but more often than not, it's actually unintentional. One example is participants that bring their type-approved consumer radios from outside of the U.S., um, e either uh, overseas or you know just other areas that have different uh, regulations, um, like our FCC ones. And those radios happen to be programmed for commercial or amateur U.S. frequencies. So they accidentally transmit on those, which may stomp on some legitimate users at the event. So as you can imagine, this can also be a challenge because sometimes you don't speak the same language to resolve that issue over the air. All right, and there I am. Uh, I definitely have no one to blame but myself for that photo, so uh, take it in, I suppose. Um, the next few slides are going to focus on details about ESD dispatch, and that is where I currently volunteer as an emergency dispatcher. Uh, and we'll also talk about how Morgan joins me there sometimes as a ranger dispatch liaison. So dispatch and the communications team operate in these portable office buildings that are situated about a mile outside of the city, past what is referred to as point one. Uh, point one is the first point on the Pentagon perimeter of the city. If you remember the trash fence that we spoke about earlier, it's one of the points there. So this entire area is actually access controlled and requires staff credentials to enter. So just as we mentioned earlier that you do not pass the trash fence uh, if you are a participant unless you are leaving the event. Similarly, if you find yourself at this location, you are not going to be getting in unless you're a volunteer. So ESD dispatchers have a quite capable set of technology to do their job as a emergency dispatcher. Just like a normal 911 dispatcher would in bigger cities, we have a pretty good tool set available to us. This includes uh, vendor provided radio consoles for choosing any of those citywide talk groups. Uh, we have full call history, playback that is useful if things get really busy and we miss something or for just later review uh, of any given call. And the heart of our dispatch operations is our CAD. That is a computer-aided dispatch system. So the CAD tracks every call from start to finish, and that's also for post-event review year-round. When a dispatcher first receives a call, they immediately create an event for it, and then they add details about the location, the caller, type of incident, any other information that's provided that is useful context for that call. The same call is then able to be handed off to other dispatchers to attach and dispatch units, and they can ultimately respond to that call. Um, those units are also tracked on a custom map. Uh, we have the, the city map that we saw earlier that's uh, overlaid on the CAD and the radio console, so we can track our units as they are dispatched. 
And then finally, we also have another console for uh, our pager network. And we can use that for sending custom text messages to select units. And the CAD finally also will send out pages to those units whenever they're attached to a call. So they have that information in the text form ready for them to look at. So an important note is that once ESD begins service in BlackRock City, when a given number of volunteers arrive on site, we then guarantee around the clock emergency services are provided from that point on. Once we go online, our standard of cover is 24 hours a day for 16 days. A few years ago, the daily call volume handled by ESD dispatch in BlackRock City was nearly the same as the city of Boston, Massachusetts, here in the United States. The statistics shown on this slide are for the most recent Burning Man event, and they should give you an idea of the event's scale and how it compares to normal cities in terms of call volume. So I'm just going to read off a little bit of this. During the 16 days, there were about 1,200 calls. About 71% of those were medical related, 9% were some form of a crisis situation, and only 2% were actually fire related. As we mentioned, there just aren't actually that many fire accidents in Burning Man. Now, Thursday and Friday of the event week are typically the busiest event days of the event by far, uh, and that goes just as true for uh, our call volume as well. We have over 175 calls each day for Thursday and Friday. One thing that we're really proud about in ESD is our response times. On average, we've got units dispatched and rolling within one and a half minutes, and they are on scene in under eight minutes. So eight minutes is actually a very good number for our city. The speed limit for all but the most critical calls is still very low due to the large density of foot and bicycle traffic. And as you can imagine from some of the pictures you've seen, it can be very challenging to navigate the city and ultimately find where you're going based on the descriptions that you get over the radio. So this slide shows some of the actual roles that ESD staff in our shack at any given time. There's a supervisor and a lead dispatcher. They're there to handle any escalations, interactions with the rest of ESD and also other departments. Uh, and then there are three primary dispatcher seats. There's one for the 911 spot, one for a position called Ops 1, and then one for Ops 2. So about those different roles. The 911 dispatcher handles all of the incoming emergency calls from people in the field. They can receive calls from a primary talk group, uh, a backup analog channel in case there's something wrong with the talk group. And at future events, we're going to have an additional license frequency that we, uh, as ESD, are actually going to share with the larger theme camps and they can program that into their own radios and they can use that to contact us in an emergency directly. So that'll cut down on the actual uh, response time a little bit more in those situations. So the two ops uh, seats. Ops 1 is our emergency unit dispatcher. They determine the right medical or fire units to attach to calls and they dispatch them. That's their sole job because those are time sensitive, very important uh, units to get on a call. Ops 2 is a bit of a dual role. They take in calls from ESD staff. Uh, that includes people at medical stations, um, staff at medical stations rather, and occasionally they also handle various administrative traffic. They're also responsible though for dispatching our non-emergent units, and mainly that includes our crisis intervention teams that we mentioned we have a little bit of uh, call volume for them before. In addition to the numerous CST roles, the Black Rock Rangers also have a seat in the shack. Um, while Rangers actually have their own dedicated dispatch center, this role, known as the Weasel, greatly await, uh, raises cross-situational awareness of both between uh, Rangers and ESD, and allows for uh, to work together more efficiently uh, uh, and uh, optimize communications between the two teams with everyone in the same room. Yeah, that's a relatively new role and it's really made things a lot easier for um, on the ESD side of the house and I imagine the Ranger side as well, just being able to uh, talk with someone in the same room instead of having to go through another radio channel. It's been great. All right, so here's a another information dense slide that covers the primary unit types that we have available at Black Rock City. Uh, for medical units, we make heavy use of these small kind of quick response vehicles called QRVs, and those house our basic life support teams. Those teams are operated and staffed by Burning Man volunteers. 
We also have a number of full-size ambulances. We call those Deltas at Burning Man, and those provide our advanced life support. The people that staff those are actually contracted EMTs and paramedics. Um, those Delta units, you know, as the ambulances are called, are also used for what we call off playa transports. And that's when a patient needs to be taken to a larger hospital facility in Reno or elsewhere for whatever their case may be. Those calls can tie up a Delta unit for easily over four hours. So it's, uh, it's worth calling out here that that's a pretty impactful thing. For critical medical transport, so someone that needs to get to a, one of those trauma centers quickly, we also have rotor wing, you know, helicopter resources available in the early and later parts of the service. And during the core event week, we also have a contract that keeps several fixed wing air ambulances dedicated to the event. And what I mean by that is we always have a fixed wing aircraft on site that can transport someone right away. So as soon as we start to dispatch one of those aircraft out, another is immediately started uh, flying in from uh, you know, Reno or wherever to our airport and take its place. On the fire side of the house, we have a variety of smaller apparatus, as well as uh, one unit dedicated to hazardous materials incidents and heavier technical rescues. They often work with other departments to handle large spills of fuel or environmentally dangerous substances, in addition to their normal emergency calls or rescue calls that they may get. And since there's no plumbing at Black Rock City, that means there's no fire hydrants either. In the event of a large undesired fire, we would have either our smaller Type 2 tenders attached to the call or even one of the larger 4,000 gallon Type 1 support tenders. Now, as you may expect, most of these units are also pre-staged at the larger burns to minimize response time if something goes wrong there. And then finally, we have our ESD crisis intervention teams and legal 2000 units, which can provide involuntary medical holds as needed. Alrighty, so here's another map, and this one shows the city uh, with the medical stations, the ESD medical stations, uh, plotted on it throughout the city. So this also happens to be where we distribute the various emergency units while they wait to be dispatched. Uh, we call that posting our units. Uh, just in the, as in any city, we are going to have units move up or reposition to ensure that we maintain even coverage throughout the day when a given unit ends up on a call. The Black Rock Rangers also have um, different uh, specialty subteams, uh, and Rangers roam the entire city uh, or are posted at our own various stations around the city. Yeah, that's actually a good point. And uh, Morgan, there's a specific ranger team that actually works hand in hand with our uh, crisis intervention team on the ESD side, isn't that right? Uh, there is the a group known as the Green Dot uh, Rangers. Um, uh, they tell they they also help people who are in various states of crisis. Yeah, that's a you know as we mentioned earlier, the rangers are often the first line that a participant has when they have any kind of a problem. So the fact that they have some people that can be a, uh, a soft transition to the medical side is really helpful in our, in our opinion as well. Alrighty, so this is actually just a, a photo um, showing one of our inner city medical stations. And uh, on the left there, you can see one of those quick response vehicles. So this just gives an idea of uh, what our field stations are like and what you can expect if you're uh, there as a participant and you need some kind of medical care and you can walk over to, to one of those stations. Well, just like Burning Man always feels like it's over too soon, that's all we have for you today. Uh, thank you for watching. Hopefully, as you can see from all of this um, and the title of the presentation, uh, this truly is not a drill. Um, effective emergency communications and utilizing ICS organization is the key to enabling the safety of everyone at Burning Man. Absolutely. Uh, that's one of the key reasons that I just love volunteering with ESD at Burning Man. It really lets us utilize all those emergency management and communication skills that we've trained and drilled on throughout the year. So hopefully this is insightful and interesting, and maybe in the future we'll see a few familiar faces out there at Burning Man. Thank you all. I uh, really hope you've enjoyed the presentation and we look forward to your questions.